we would have bubbles on the Eurostar and we would go to these great meetings and I just loved all the different people, all the politics of it. I don't want to get sucked into these golden handcuffs while I'm still young. It sounds so interesting and something you kind of just see on the news or you see the news article about it afterwards. I didn't know I was going to get a job when I did a brunch shift on a Sunday. I didn't know I was going to get a job at a cocktail brunch in Paris. You don't know where the opportunity is, but if you don't go to these things, you will never find out. Welcome to the File Notes podcast. I'm thrilled to have you join us today for our episode with Sarah Salmond. Sarah is a partner at Minter Allison and Rudd Watts. With 24 years of experience, Sarah is a commercial lawyer extraordinaire, advising clients on a wide array of matters ranging from public and regulatory issues to international trade and financial crimes. Sarah's accolades speak volumes about her expertise. Named on New Zealand Lawyers Elite Women List for 2023, and honoured as an Asia Pacific's International Trade Lawyer of the Year at the Women in Business Law Awards for 2023. But Sarah's journey is not just about her accolades, it's about seizing opportunities and making an impact. From her days as a trade association representative to her tenure in London and Paris, Sarah's path has been marked by being in the right place at the right time and asking the right questions. These experiences, spanning across borders and disciplines, have shaped her into the exceptional lawyer that she is today. In our discussion, join us as we delve into Sarah's journey, her insights and her invaluable lessons she's learned along the way. So thank you for joining, Sarah. I wanted to start at the start of your career, where you studied a BA in politics and a BCom in public policy and commercial law. And your career took off unexpectedly when you stumbled upon an opportunity while working as a bartender. Could you share that encounter and how that led to your first role at NPR? Sure. There was a really opportune encounter, actually. I worked as a bartender at Dockside for maybe four years while I was studying. And one Sunday morning, I was doing a brunch shift and a couple came in for brunch and I had no other customers. And they said, why don't you sit down and have a chat to us? So I did. The guy said, look, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I, for some reason, I think I was taking a trade paper at uni at the time. I said, I'd like to be an international trade negotiator, which I would have thought was quite random. But he said, oh, my goodness, I am the director of the international trade negotiations team at the um, Ministry for Primary Industries. And, and one day I'm going to give you a job. And I thought, oh, sure, that's not true. But I sent him my CV and um, crossed my fingers and and had forgotten about it, actually, when I got an email out of the blue telling me to come for an interview. Um, and I can't say I performed brilliantly in the interview. I was questioned on things like, what's your view on biosecurity? And I had to ask, what is biosecurity? But I was lucky enough they gave me a job, which I did part-time till I finished study and then full-time when I finished. And I, I did that for two and a half years, and that was fantastic. And before that role, you didn't know what biosecurity was, but did you have any other interest in the primary primary industries or government or any of that? Do you know what, to be honest, not specifically. I was just really interested in international issues. All my university papers, wherever I had a choice, I wanted to look at the big picture thing, the macro thing, the international thing. And so I was just really attracted to that. I think also in the late 90s, There was a lot of things happening at the World Trade Organization. Trade was really in the news. It was the top of the agenda. And and I was really interested, but I didn't have I didn't have an agricultural background or a food industry background. I'd probably never really been to a farm. So I can't say that that was my primary love, but I developed a real interest um, and expertise over time. And it was just fortuitous that that's where I started my career. Today's episode is sponsored by VXT, the phone system built for law firms. VXT integrates with practice management systems so that when lawyers make calls, their billable time and legal advice can be saved in the right place automatically. 20% of billable time goes unrecorded. A lot of that is phone calls that get forgotten about. Get some of those billables back using VXT. Go to vxt.co.nz or click the link in the description to find out more. And why do you think trade was kind of exploding at that point in time? So in the uh, late 90s or the mid 90s, New Zealand was negotiating like many other um, countries 
in the WTO Uruguay round of trade talks, which was a fundamental international system of treaties that changed the way that we regulate international trade. So that was hugely important for New Zealand and because we're such a, a, an international trading nation, a, a lot of our revenue comes from exporting our cultural products. And we have really, really talented, passionate negotiators who negotiated really great deals and great market access for New Zealand products. And that was so important to the economy. It was all over the news at the time I was looking for a job. And so what do those kind of negotiations look like? That's a really good question. So actually on my first day of full time at MPI, they very kindly flew me to Geneva for WTO Agriculture Committee meetings and Environment Committee meetings. And I mean, I was there really just to carry bags and photocopy things. And <laughs> I can't say I really contributed much, but it was one of the most amazing learning experiences. And I think New Zealand is really good at giving young people opportunities that you'd have to be 40 to have, you know, working for lots of other governments. But the way it works is you have a huge me meeting room where the WTO members sit and exchange views. There's lots of different translators who are translating all the different comments. And, and you, will have, you will have a text which the Secretariat has produced and then all the different WTO members will chip in their thoughts. You'll have breakout rooms where real deals are being done. But eventually things have to come back to that plenary meeting and be agreed by the group. But it's a long, drawn-out process. These negotiations take years and they're highly detailed and there's a lot of brokering and a lot of side room discussions. But just to have that chance as a junior person to actually see it in real life brings it to life because it, you can read about it forever, but it doesn't mean anything until you're actually in the room, seeing it, hearing it, living it. It's quite an experience. Yeah, I could imagine it sounds so interesting and something you kind of just see on the news or you see the news article about it afterwards. Yeah. And so you actually have been able to present at the World Trade Organization, if I'm correct. Yes. I did. I <laughs> I delivered a New Zealand statement on food aid and the sort of regulation around food aid. And it was quite a long statement and and I was told I could read it, but I was so nervous that I spoke so, so fast that I had a colleague next to me, Stephanie Honey, who who basically had her hand right by my knee going, slow down, slow down. And eventually the translator said, Can someone tell the speaker from New Zealand to slow down? So, you know, I, I was just so nervous, but but I did it. And I think you get a lot of confidence just from giving something a try. It doesn't matter that it's not all that good. At the beginning, none of us are all that good. But yeah, I, I've got better at these things over time. <laughs> so after working at MPI, you decided to go on your OE and you ended up in Paris working for the OECD. What was that role like and how did you end up there? Yeah, so that was another really great opportunity. MPI had sent me on another trip to uh, Paris for some OECD Agricultural Environment Committee meetings. And I was there for about a week. And I remember going to a cocktail function. They always had these cocktail functions. And one of the really nice British guys in the OECD secretariat, we were chatting, and, and he said to me afterwards, oh, now your boss isn't here. What are your plans for the future? What are you going to do? Would you ever want to come to Paris? You could always work here. And again, I thought, oh, I'm pretty sure that that's not a real offer. But I remember thinking, I'm going to go on my OE. I might just drop them an email and see what happens. And they actually set me up with a consultancy. So I worked there for four months. And it was a great experience. There are some really, really talented people at the OECD and some people I was very fond of. I was a bit frustrated, though, because no matter how brilliant those people are and no matter how hard they work on an academic paper and no, how, no matter how beautiful that draft paper is and how insightful and helpful it would be, the OECD is a political organisation, so every draft paper before it's published goes to a committee of all the OECD member states. And what we found is we did great work, but it would go to committee and everything contentious and everything interesting, anything controversial is stripped out. And what, get, what gets published is really, is really pretty dry and pretty uncontroversial. And I just felt for me... That was just, I just couldn't continue to do that. I found that 
just too just too disappointing to be honest so so I felt I needed to do something else even though I was hugely grateful for that the chance to live in Paris and to see how that organization works I just wanted to be able to be a bit more free and honest with the contribution I wanted to make yeah I imagine it'd be so frustrating when you put so much work into something and then it just doesn't get included I would hate that if it was yeah something that I was working on yeah, it's really difficult. And what you do find in some of these international organisations is people are paid really well. People get a tax-free salary. They get private school education for their children. They often live in a lovely house. They have a lovely commute. They have lovely colleagues. They've got a steam job, a beautiful office. And it's really hard to leave for some people, even if professionally you're unsatisfied and unfulfilled. And I just thought, I don't want to get sucked into these golden handcuffs while I'm still young and without obligations, I'm going to, I'm going to move on. And how did you like living in Paris in general? Paris is a a beautiful city. I was lucky enough to live in the 16th arrondissement. Actually, (laughs) New Zealand's deputy ambassador at the time had some room in his house for a while. So he he kind of let me stay with him. So I was living in a, a, a fantastic part of town. It is one of those cities that is just really great, but if you don't speak good French, and I don't, you can feel quite isolated, like you're walking around in a bubble. And I think if you're an extroverted social person, I really missed being able to just talk to random people in a cafe. Or I just felt, yeah, I found that quite quite difficult. So I enjoyed it, and I'm glad I did it. But again, that was something I was happy to to move on and to move to London where people speak English (laughs) and I felt that I could engage more in the way that I wanted to. Yeah, it's definitely like going overseas on an OE or going to work somewhere in an English-speaking place is like that's one thing, but then going to somewhere where they don't speak your language and like trying to fit into the culture and society there is just like a whole other ball game and it's definitely got its own unique challenges and cool parts. Yeah, that's right. And I think even in places where English is widely spoken, so the Nordic countries or Holland or whatever, even though everyone can speak to you and they, they're really kind and hospitable, you do know that at a certain point in the night, they're going to want to speak their own language and you will at that point be excluded. And so I do I do think it is a bit harder to live anywhere where it's not the main language. And I think, as I said, if you're a, a sort of socially gregarious outgoing person, I think it just really clips your wings. <laughs> in a way that I just, yeah, have decided since then not not, not to do again. <laughs> so then yeah. you just to go to London. And at this point, you've never actually applied for a job because you've had amazing opportunities where you've put yourself out there and stumbled into amazing roles. When you moved to London and started this job searching, how did that experience go? So, so yeah, I, I used to read the Time magazine because I had a lot more time once upon a time. And I remember they always had really amazing international sounding roles. And there was this one that was advertised for an agricultural economist. And I didn't really do economics at at university. I did two economics papers, but I wouldn't call myself an economist. But I knew a lot by this point about international trade and agricultural products. And so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll have a go. I'll apply for this job at the National Farmers Union. And I did the interview and I didn't get the job, which I was quite disappointed about. But a few weeks later, they got in touch with me and said, actually, a second job's come up. Do you want to have a go at this? So I I worked as an agricultural economist for, I don't know, nine months, 10 months or so. And that was really interesting because that was my first opportunity to work in a trade association, like a representative organisation that was representing farmers before the UK government. And there was quite a large team of economists. And I really enjoyed it. And we had a lot of fun. But what I what I learned from that experience was, while I'm numerate, I, I don't really like spending my whole day with a Excel spreadsheet by myself. And so I think, yeah, I did that for nine or ten months and thought, this this is not for me either. And I, I found another job in the Economist <laughs> and went to work at the UK Food and Drink Federation. And did you love that a lot more? I did actually. So so that job was representing British food and drink manufacturers and the work was both looking at international trade and how to help them trade more competitively overseas, but also looking at regulatory frameworks and how they could be improved 
to enhance the competitiveness of food and drink manufacturers. And what was really great about that role is there was a lot of talking to the members. So I was always talking to the government affairs or sales people from different corporates and also synthesizing their views and then representing them by presenting to government officials or to parliament or I would often go on the Eurostar with my boss to meetings in Brussels of the European, all the different European member state food and drink federations and we would have bubbles on the Eurostar and we would go to these great meetings and I just loved all the different people, all the politics of it. I mean the politics of a trade association are really quite fascinating and the way that it can be quite difficult on contentious things for a trade association to say much. You will almost get left with the lowest common denominator position. So I think that was a really good lesson in working with industry, being involved in advocacy. It was it was a really interesting experience. And I did that for for three years and had a great team and really loved it. But I went to a conference and I remember asking a question of the then EU Trade Commissioner Peter Mandelson. And a partner from a international law firm came up to me and started talking to me and, and asking what I was doing and um, ended up offering me a job at DLA Piper where they were looking to develop an international trade practice, which was unusual at the time in a law firm because the UK was a member of the EU and the EU had done all the trade negotiations on behalf of the UK since 1973. So there were very few trade practices in the UK but he thought there is a market for this and I'd like to employ you as a trade specialist. So that was my first foray into law at the beginning of 2007. And how did you feel about that transition initially going into the legal realm? Yeah, so for me that was a big change. That was probably one of the most dramatic changes in my career because I'd always worked in relatively sort of confined teams within, you know, relatively small organisations. And DLA Piper is the, or was, the biggest law firm in the world. And the London office was, I think it was about 3,000 people. And everyone was so bright and all the systems were so slick and all the marketing was so fancy. And everyone was really busy. I think I'd seen a lot of people previously go, I'm really busy, I'm really busy. But then... Then I felt like I saw what really busy was, but I loved it. I kind of felt, gosh, I've come alive. This is so dynamic. These people are amazing. I had an incredible boss, a Spanish lady called Miriam Gonzalez, and she was such an incredible role model to watch. And I just learned so much in that role. The opportunities were really quite incredible. So I, I loved it, but it was a huge, it was a huge change for me at the time. Yeah. And considering you at that point, you weren't a lawyer. How did your, what did your role look like compared to someone who was a lawyer, maybe in the same department? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because trade is very much, I think if you're to approach trade properly, it requires legal input, but also it's very political, very economic. It's, it's really helpful to have that broad skill set. So the way I would usually work is, you know, I would do research, I would prepare a draft of something, but there would always be and had to always be a qualified lawyer who would review things. But I did over time, as I became more and more confident with the work I was doing, I knew how to do the legal work, <laughs> but I wasn't qualified as a lawyer. And I think that did make me feel frustrated because eventually I knew there was a ceiling for me because I could not sign out my own work. So that was, it was great work, but I knew at a certain point it would have to come to an end because I couldn't progress any further and I'm not the kind of person who can just stop and be happy just sitting where I am yeah and so at one point the partner at the firm offered you wanted to make you a partner but as you just mentioned you weren't a lawyer and you'd have to be a lawyer to do that so you actually decided to go back and retrain as a lawyer can <laughs> you tell me what that was like yeah that was <laughs> that was yeah that was interesting so DLA very kindly let me come back to New Zealand and do a law degree. I did a full law degree in two years and four months. So I was doing six or seven papers a semester, which was crazy, plus billing 20 hours a week in my spare time for the firm in London and traveling up to London three times a year. So for two years and four months in my 
late 20s, early 30s, I lived with my parents and worked continuously, unless I was going out. I, I didn't watch TV. I just worked incredibly hard. And it's interesting going to uni as a mature student because you find yourself sitting at the front asking the question. I mean, it's, I was just the stereotypical mature student, but I really loved it because I knew, I knew why I was doing it and I knew what I was interested in. And I knew that I, I needed to get good grades in the papers that mattered to me. And I did really apply myself, but it was exhausting. So I was, I, I've never worked that hard in my life. And I am relieved that I will never go back to uni. After seven and a half years, I will never be going back ever again. <laughs> yeah. On one hand, like I loved my university experience, but then I'm also kind of wish that sometimes I maybe did, cause I did law and commerce. Maybe I wish I did commerce once I've actually had some experience because then you can actually say, oh, this is actually relevant for this. Because otherwise you sit there and you're just studying it to pass rather yeah. than saying, I want to be really good at this and use this. Because now I look back and I'm like, oh, would have been really helpful if I actually studied that really well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you never regret what you do or I don't. I, reg- you know, I, if ever I regret anything, it's the things that I don't do. So I think if I'm interested in something, I learn about it. If I'm interested in something, but I know I actually need a qualification to do it, I'm going to go get a qualification. Like I think I just have always felt a little bit impulsive in that way and that I just have to chase the things I really want to do. Mm-hmm. And they're worth it, you know, if it's if it's the right thing. And I think for me, I've always found my gut and tell me what the right thing is. If it's the right thing, it will be worth it. And even though in my experience that two years, four months, of, of incredibly hard work was really brutal and it felt really long at the time. It's now such a long time ago, it's Constantina back on itself and it feels like it was over relatively quickly, but I'm so glad I did it because if I didn't, I wouldn't be here now. So, And so when you went to study your law degree, you did this so that you could potentially become partner, but you actually decided to stay in New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah I mean that was very difficult because my firm in London had you know given me a really great opportunity to work from home and study and and always been incredibly accommodating for two years and four months and then but my personal circumstances changed and I'd been home for two years and four months I'd met someone and I, I at the end of it I didn't actually want to go back to the UK and so I decided right How am I going to, where is the trade practice, trade regulatory practice that I can join in New Zealand? And there wasn't one. So I thought, right, how will I establish one? And I wrote an email to a partner at Russell McVeigh, Tim Clark, saying, Tim, I I don't know you. I'd love to meet you. I would love to start a trade practice. Can we have a chat? And we had a coffee and that went from there. And then Russell McVeigh gave me a chance to start a trade practice with him. It's awesome. And so now you're at Minters. And so so there you focus on public regulatory and international law, particularly in trade. What does your day look like day to day? And is that the same as what you were doing at Russell McVeigh? So no, it's not the same. My practice is broader at Minters than it was at Russ McVeigh. And it, it looks different every day, to be honest, because it really depends what work we've got on at any moment in time. So if I think about what have my days looked like over the last three months, sometimes we're really we're working on really fascinating sanctions matters. A lot of them are high profile, they're in the media, they're complex investigations really tricky points of law, working with lawyers, particularly in the US and Australia, but also in the UK and the Cayman Islands. And that work, I'm like, my whole team, we're like pigs in mud. We just absolutely love it. So we just get all over that. Other times we're working on um, really complicated regulatory matters. So we've got about probably five matters at the moment where we're working with um, American or Chinese companies, very household name companies, who are looking to bring cutting-edge technologies to the New Zealand market. But because of the nature of those technologies, you need licenses to supply or licenses to transmit or special kinds of regulatory approvals to actually do the things they want to do. So we're working with, with those companies and with local council in those countries 
to work out how do we get your products here? How do we put together the necessary applications? And once we've got those, what are the new regulatory requirements you need to meet? What are the new customs requirements you need to meet? So a lot of that work is really exciting. And when we see, you know, the advertisements start to come out that this product is actually on the market, it's like, yeah, we did some of that. So so that's great. We also, I mean, there's also, there's a split between doing the work and then actually finding the work. So one of the things I quite like doing is actually the business development because you've got to generate new instructions to work on. So we write client alerts. Like today I've been writing a client alert about a new advisory group report on New Zealand sanctions regime, and we've really enjoyed writing that. Some days tomorrow I'm going to a a big lunch with the, the Minister of Finance. So there's lots of research, writing, client advice, liaising with clients, going to events. It's a really, really diverse workload. And oh, and the other thing that I'm doing a lot of at the moment is it's our recruitment campaign coming up. So every May we do extensive interviews of potential law clerks. And that is one of the things that I love most in the year is actually interviewing young people, bringing them on board and, and watching them fly actually once they're here and watching them realize oh you know gosh this is really interesting I found a career for me and watching them enjoy it is really rewarding and so that'd be quite interesting to talk about when clerks are applying for a clerkship or a grad role what do you look for in a grad or clerk I love to see people who are a bit rounded who've actually gone and done something charitable maybe some debating they're interested in some sports someone who has a CV that doesn't just tell you what their grades are, but talks about who they are, where they want to go, what motivates them, what are they passionate about. You kind of want some life in that paper. And I also think a bit of honesty goes a long way too, particularly during COVID. We got CVs where people said, you know, my semester two marks were not that great. And it's because I was under huge pressure and blah, blah, blah. And you you could see that that was true. And I think actually... A bit of vulnerability and a bit of honesty in a cover letter is really, for me, welcome as well. Yeah. So sanctions, they are increasingly used foreign policy too. Mm -hmm. Could you discuss the role of sanctions in international trade and some of the challenges businesses face? How long have you got? So sanctions are prohibitions and restrictions on different types of dealings and they are imposed in order to express New Zealand or any other government who imposes them their concern about a situation that's a breach of international peace and security somewhere. And we are seeing a proliferation in the use of sanctions in recent years, in part because it's a far less politically costly thing to do than to actually send your army into a situation of concern to resolve it. So what we've seen with the situation, say, for example, in Ukraine, you don't see armed forces from Western nations marching in to assist on the battlefield in Ukraine, but you do see nations, all sorts of countries, introducing different types of sanctions which restrict people subject to their jurisdiction from dealing with particular parties um, in Russia or in certain types of industries and sectors. So we're seeing a proliferation of these sanctions around the world. In order to manage all these risks, a lot of um, banks and financiers in particular are putting a lot of sanctions-related clauses into contracts which require the signatory to comply with a lot of rules that they might not otherwise comply to comply with. And then for big organisations, in order to manage their sanctions risks, they're establishing their own sanctions compliance policies which say... And say in the case of a bank, we'll say things like, we will not bank, we will not do any type of transaction that has a material nexus to Iran, North Korea, Syria, etc. So so you have to think about New Zealand sanctions, foreign countries sanctions, UN sanctions, contractual provisions, corporate policies. There's a lot going on there. And I think one of the things that's often overlooked is when people are trying to quantify what is the cost of imposing sanctions, they look about what is the cost for the government of employing the officials who administer and enforce the regime. It's so much more than that. There's a report out at the moment which says the first year of introducing New Zealand's Russia sanctions regime cost the New Zealand government $2 million. Well, I can tell you that it cost the business community 
an infinite amount more than that in terms of expenditure on compliance and dispute resolution, but also in terms of the serious losses a lot of New Zealand companies made because their assets were seized or their assets were significantly devalued or indeed completely written off. So I think it's really important going forward that we in New Zealand have a really honest, well-informed discussion about the pros and cons of sanctions, that we understand fully what the costs and benefits are, and private sector involvement in that process is going to be critical if we're going to get it right. But yeah, sanctions, compliance, disputes have cost New Zealand businesses a very significant amount of money. And that's not to say that sanctions don't have a place, but we need to be open-eyed when we think we want to have more. What are the pros and cons of, of doing that? Yeah, and I guess that's something that the general public of New Zealand, when you see the news articles saying, we need sanctions, they're not doing sanctions, but then don't actually fully understand the cost at the back end of that. Yeah, and one thing we will need to be very, very careful about is... We're talking at the moment about creating a general legislative power that would enable the New Zealand government to introduce new sanctions whenever there is a situation of grave human rights concerns in different parts of the world. If we create this legislative power, the New Zealand government will be expected to use it. And there are a number of situations, and it's probably too delicate to even mention them, but there is a number of situations around the world right now that New Zealand is very concerned about. If we have a power to do something about them, we will need to do something about them. And I think we need to remember that sometimes people don't take being sanctioned lying down. They retaliate. And you can often retaliate by putting in place counter sanctions or you might put in place trade bans. So if we take, if we impose material sanctions on some of our trading partners because we don't like what they're doing on human rights, we might find that they retaliate with trade barriers and that could be devastating for New Zealand's economy. So I think we just need to have a really honest, open, well-informed debate about this before we do anything further. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And are there any other emerging trends or challenges that you think will arise in terms of foreign policy or international trade agreements? Yeah, there are. So I think there's a couple of trends that I would point to. One in general is that we are in a very different geopolitical international environment than we were in the late 90s when all anyone could talk about was globalization and harmonization and everyone was friendly and it felt like there weren't so many wars and we weren't quite as worried about climate change or sea level rises and everyone, the world seemed to be getting smaller. We're not in that environment anymore. And we are finding there are a lot more shocks to the system. There are a lot more companies that suddenly go out of business. There are a lot of contracts that suddenly end. There, there is just a lot more, there's a lot more shocks and risks in the system. And it's really important that New Zealand business is prepared for that and insulated from the effects of that as much as they can be. And a lot about that is about diversifying your business. So you're not wholly dependent on one market or one mode of transport or one customer. You really need to diversify and hedge your risk that way. The other trend I find is that, as we were talking about at the start, in the 90s it was all about signing WTO agreements, multilateralism, when it became apparent that we couldn't negotiate any more multilateral deals because it had just got too difficult, we moved to signing bilateral treaties. And now we're at the position where New Zealand has harvested all the low-hanging fruit in terms of trade agreements. We have all the trade agreements that we want and can get. There's two that we really want but can't get right now, being a, an FTA with the US and with India. I think for, for political, practical, many reasons, they're just not on the cards in the immediate future. So we're going to need to think for the first time in a while a bit more creatively about how are we going to improve New Zealand businesses access and engagement with other countries because the traditional ways of doing it via WTO agreements and bilateral trade investment treaties, we're not going to make a lot of headway. So we need to be more creative. And I think business really needs to engage constructively with the government so the government understands what do businesses in this modern environment actually want? Because I think at the moment we, we have a civil service who still comes from that multilateral bilateral trade treaty mindset. But 
businesses stop talking because they've lost interest, but they haven't told the government what they do want. So I really think we need to have a reset on that. And I think that that, the first step in that should be a review of New Zealand's trade policy. We haven't done a review since 1993. Um, so I think, you know, what's that, 30 years or so, I think it's high time that we do we do have a review. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And I think that might lead into something I also wanted to talk to you about is being on some boards. So you're a board member of the New Zealand International Business Forum. Can you explain what that is and maybe some of the key initiatives you've been involved with there? Yeah. So I've been a member of the New Zealand International Business Forum board for six or so years. So that is senior business leaders from some of our main exporting companies, Zespri, Fonterra, the meat companies, Sea Lord, but also a number of the key advisors to those industries. So Westpac's on the board, GS1 is on the board, and then the trade associations, that Food and Grocery Council, the Dairy Industry Association, the Export New Zealand and others. So it is primarily a, a sort of primary sector focused group. But the group's reason for being really is to try and improve New Zealand's access to the world, try and improve opportunities for New Zealand exporters. And it is a really great group to be part of. We meet every quarter and we always have guest speakers. It might be the US ambassador or the um, deputy secretary of Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. There's always someone interesting to come along. So those meetings are a great opportunity to learn, to hear what all the industries around the table are experiencing, to network with a lot of people, many of whom are our clients, to learn, but also to give back. So I think, you know, over the 25 years or so of my career, I've, I've, I've learned quite a bit about international trade and I like to contribute ideas and thoughts. And as one of the few lawyers on that group, you know, I feel I have a unique perspective that I want to share. So some of the initiatives we're working on at the moment, one that's sort of been on my desk in the last week, is paperless trade. At the moment, when you trade goods, physical goods internationally, those goods have to be accompanied by physical documents. And those documents basically entitle whoever holds the physical documents to potentially own, own the goods or to transfer the physical documents to someone else. And that transfers title to the goods to someone else. And that's a really archaic way of trading in this modern environment when everything can be done on your phone, on a computer. Why do we have to courier these physical documents around the world? And you think it would be really easy to just change the law and just go, a electronic document is the same as a paper document, the end. But unfortunately, it actually requires a fundamental overhaul of New Zealand legislation, regulations and common law to change the way we think about the nature of trade accompanying documents. So it sounds a little bit dry, but it's actually quite interesting. And I, I think, you know, the, there's a working group of us looking at this and a lot of the others are exporters or trade documentation specialists. But I think what I can contribute to that discussion particularly is an understanding of the legal obstacle that we have, what the reform process needs to look like, and importantly, if we want to get this moving, what we need to tell the ministers to make them excited enough to go, yes, this is a priority. Yes, I will appoint a cross-governmental group to look into this. And yes, I will find the money to do the work that's necessary to make this happen. So we're putting together a business case at the moment that we will share with ministers soon. And I think, you know, if we can get that across the line, the, the cost savings, efficiency gains, for New Zealand business will be huge. In addition, we will be we will be saving a lot of paper. We will be saving shipping all these things all around the world that nobody really wants. I mean, there's so many gains to be made. So I think it's a it's a no brainer. We should do it, and we will do it in time. But I think we should do it sooner rather than later. And we need government ministers to support it if that's going to happen. Uh, and so, without going into the detail, because like you said, there's so many aspects of it. But is there like a high level reason of why these physical paper copies have to be with the goods when they're traded overseas? I think it's just tradition. It's just, it's been this way for such a long time. And I think there was once upon a time, I mean, there was no other way to prove that you were entitled to something other than to go, I've got the documents, that's mine. And even though technology, since, I mean, we've had the internet since the mid nineties, 
we've been able to do PDFs of things for my my entire career, I think. So it's amazing how slow the law is sometimes at responding to new circumstances and new technologies. But, it, but to, to answer your question, the, the reason we need paper documents is just because that's always how it's been done. When something's been done for such a long period of time, the requirement to do it is peppered throughout so many different bits of legislation, regulations, policy guidelines, common law precedent is everywhere. So it is going to be a big exercise for someone to go. We will find every single place where the law requires this and we will pass some legislation which overrides all of it. That's quite a big exercise and the difficulty is because these bits of legislation cut across foreign affairs, customs, you know, Ministry for Primary Industries, Commercial Law Act, there's so many different ministries that will need to participate in this law reform process. So it's it's a big bit of work, but an important one. Yeah, it's super fascinating. And so now I kind of have a bunch of questions I want to ask you, which is a bunch of advice questions, given you have a wealth of experience and are very worldly. So starting off is your story highlights the importance of networking and trusting your instincts in your career journey. Do you have any advice to give individuals navigating a career transition, especially looking to maybe switch fields like you did? So it's a good question. And I think you, you've summarized some sort of threads out of my story really well. I think it's really important to talk to everyone you know, be willing to to go to a function, to to send an email that you feel uncomfortable about sending, to go to an event where you don't know anyone, because you never know where the opportunities will be. I didn't know I was going to get a job when I did a brunch shift on a Sunday. I didn't know I was going to get a job at a cocktail brunch in Paris. You don't know where the opportunity is, but if you don't go to these things, you will never find out. So take opportunities. And I still do this now. So I still to the extent that I can, I get a lot of people who write to me and say, I'm thinking about a career in trade. Can I come and talk to you? Or, you know, I've read an article. I work for this company. Can I come and talk to you? And I always meet people because you never know where anything leads. And it, it may not be that that person comes to work for you or that company instructs you, but they might talk to someone who does instruct you or they might talk to someone who does come and work for you. So I think you just have to put yourself out there and, and not take things personally. So I think, you know, I get all sorts of marketing people wanting to sell me a new website or a HR assistant in cyberspace or a, a translation service, and they don't reply, but it's not personal. So if you send an email to someone and they don't want to have a coffee with you or they don't want to look at your CV or they don't reply, don't take it personally, but you've got to put as many lines in the ocean as you can and you'll catch something. Another thing I think is really important is just to do what you love. So I think it's just so important. I believe you only live once, so I think you may as well be doing something you you enjoy. And as my dad said, if you do something you enjoy, you never work a proper day in your life. So. How do you keep loving what you're doing? I think I just picked the right thing, to be honest. I think I'm just so interested in the issues and it's always changing and it's very dynamic. But I also think it's a mindset and I like to surround myself with positive people. My team are really positive and we all seem to get off on the same stuff. So we can sort of whip ourselves up into a frenzy of excitement about all sorts of obscure things. Yeah. And I think it's quite interesting because most people that you speak to at law firms, well, not most, but quite a lot of them are still at the same firm that they started as a grad at. And so you've bounced around so much that you do really get to see what parts you do love and what you don't love. So obviously you've ended up somewhere that you're loving. Yeah, and I think both approaches are great, right? If you happen to have won the lottery and walked into a firm and you love it and you stay forever and make partner, and we, we have people in our firm who've done that. That is fantastic, right? That's great. For a lot of us in life, though, we, we you know, have a drive to do an OE or we're just are curious and we need to know what something else is like. And for me, I just, you know, I had other talents. I wasn't just good at law. I was good at some other things I was curious about other things and I'm really glad to have had what might look like a pretty non-linear non-rapid road to where I am here but I'm really glad to be able to sit here now and think no I didn't want to be a government official or a reg or you know a regulator or a 
international. I, I really wanted to be here because I've tried those other things and they're fascinating and they're all part of my journey and experience. And, but that's not what I wanted to do. So I'm I'm glad as a curious person to have given a bunch of different things a try and to end up where I am. And so you invest a lot of time in mentoring and supporting women in the profession. Is there any strategies that you have found effective in achieving work-life balance and advancing your career, particularly as a woman? So so this is a, a really difficult subject, yeah. I mean, I remember when I started my career and in law firms and the partner I worked for and the senior advisor we had were both women and they both had families and they were always talking about women's issues and going to women's events and I thought why on earth are they worried about this because you see complete gender equality as a person in your early mid-20s there's there's no difference no one's got family responsibility so I didn't understand why they were talking about this so much the older I've got and I've now you know I'm married I have three children that that also is a really big commitment of mine and that's a commitment that I want to honour and it, it takes a lot of time. And managing work and home can be difficult. And I, I think the reality is, and there will always be exceptions, but the reality is women do the bulk of childcare and the bulk of work around the house and carry the mental load. And I think that's just fact. And so it can be really difficult, particularly in the legal profession. You will see at senior associate level, a lot of women who will leave a firm, who will go down to reduce hours. And my God, they're efficient when they're here because they squeeze everything into condensed hours. But it's frustrating, I think, for many of them because they are tired. They do not feel that they can put a foot forward and progress the partner because they just feel like that would be that would be the end of them. And so one of the things that I really love doing is mentoring women at that point when they are juggling and how to manage that. And I think there's no one recipe for how to juggle that works for everyone. But what has worked for me, and I'm lucky that I can do this, but is to outsource things that I can't do so or, or to outsource things that I can outsource, which give me back time in my day to do other things. So things like cleaning and help around the house and we have a nanny and things and, and that that really does help take a bit of pressure off but for others just being able to work from home and taking that time out of the commute to and from work so you can be at home you can receive the delivery you can do pick up and drop off and pop your kids in front of the tv you can put the laundry on and things just being able to work from home and be flexible in hours has been a complete game changer for a lot of senior women. And so we need to continue to think really hard as firms about what can we do to make that juggle easier for people so we do not lose lose these women. Because I think it's really, it must be quite disheartening when 60 plus percent of grads and, and people who come into our firms are women and they look for role models and they can't see them in certain areas. So I think we need to keep these women and we need to think about how. But I do think there's also a really important societal piece around how do we encourage people to better share the workload at home. And firms and governments cannot regulate that. We cannot go in and say, you're doing half the laundry. You're doing... and, and so that's really difficult. And I think that is proving that's taking time to change. And, and certainly there's lots of examples where you have men who do maybe all the housework. You know, you do have examples, but in the majority of cases, it's women. So I, I don't know how we unlock that split of work at home. Yeah. And so I've seen in some consulting firms that have introduced some part-time partners where they can be partner but still work semi-part-time hours. Do you think the legal industry would ever do anything like this? Oh, definitely. Definitely. We have part-time partners now and other firms do as well. The, the trick there is is to be really clear about your boundaries because what you don't want to get in is to a situation I've seen with a couple of friends who become part-time partners, but what that actually ends up being is being paid part-time, but working full-time. So you really have to be able to set very clear boundaries about when you are and you aren't working. You need to have a little bit of flexibility because sometimes something has to be done urgently, but you must reclaim. If you had to work a Friday and it's your normal day off, you need to be clear about reclaiming a Monday or whatever because otherwise you will become really angry with that situation and it won't work for you so use part-time partners but you need good boundaries yeah 
So speaking more broadly now about the legal industry, there was a tragic incident with a law firm partner in London, which Mm -hmm. highlighted the issue of burnout in high pressure professions. How do you think we can address this issue more effectively, both like on an individual level, but then also in the broader organisational culture in the legal industry? Yeah, so I think we are very good actually in law firms at collecting data. So we can see broadly how many hours someone is recording a day, how many billable hours they're doing, how many business development hours, how many hours of functions. We can see that. So if someone at our firm was working 12 hours a day, we would get red dots flashing up and we would know and we would do something about that. So I think data is a great way to make sure you identify overwork. But then you have to have systems and procedures and people who are tasked with intervening when someone is overworking. And I think it's difficult because sometimes people don't even know that they are about to burn out until it happens. So even when some someone is really busy and you say, are you okay? Do you need anything? Can I take this from you? People go, no, 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 I'm fine. And then the wheels fall off. So I think actually for organizations, it's about having a really clear policy you know, for collecting the data, stepping in at certain points and and almost insisting that when someone's work patterns get to a point where they're consistently, clearly overworking themselves just to require (laughs) that they take something off their plate because none of us can keep this up. You You can keep up being busy for a while. But eventually it will wear you down. And, and the, the case in London we're talking about is, is a classic example of just sustained overwork just eventually will catch up with you. Yeah. So now I want to finish up. I have four rapid fire questions <laughs> which you can just answer with like a sentence or a word and then I'll move on to the next one. So the first one is what single element would you want to change about the legal industry today? The proportion of women in senior roles, particularly within private sector partnerships. And if you weren't a lawyer or a trade negotiator, what would be your dream job? It is so hard to answer because I'm doing what I want to be doing. So maybe a government minister or something. Nice. And London or New Zealand? New Zealand, depending on the time of your life. And if you could go back and give your younger self one piece of advice before starting your career, what would it be? Don't worry what other people think. I love it. (laughs) Thank you so much, Sarah. If you would like to get in contact with you after listening to this, how could they do that? Drop me an email. I'm very good on responding to emails and very happy to help people who are interested. Great. And that's just on the Mentors website? Uh That's right, sarah.salmon at mentorallison.co.nz.